Sir Peter Stormare? Yes, sir. Hey, Kylie. You, you might have been Rolf Storm, right? A long time ago. Yeah. I have a lot of names, yeah. but they usually drop when you become American. Well, thanks very much. We haven't seen each other in what? 18 years. 18 years. 18 My years. God. So you were just a little boy. So for the people uh, that are watching this, we have a long well, history a long, long history. ago. A you, long. I think you just first arrived in New York. Then we had a manager where I was working with and Drew yeah. Jackson yeah. That brought you here, right? Yeah, I came to New York like first time 86, I think, 87, but I met a Japanese girl and she didn't speak English and I spoke a little Japanese, mm -hmm. but I had an AD and uh, assistant director when I was working in Japan when I first met my wife and she Tosh was Toshimi. always helped, yeah, Toshimi, my wife. So my first AD, Sue, she always helped me out and when Toshimi came to New York, I didn't understand anything and she felt like lost and blah, 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 a lot of, I just called my manager and said, do you have any Japanese American, you know, somebody who's, yeah, he got it. Yeah. <laughs> and you came over to Brooklyn Heights, right. to our apartment. I remember and, we uh, had bagels. Yeah, and we solved a lot of problems. Right, right. You, you became our middleman, and then we got a, married. Yeah, we were, uh, God, 95, we were, Yeah, I it was guess. from like 7 o'clock all the way to like 2 in the morning or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I was happy, really happy to hear, hear that you guys got married. And yeah, and we have uh, a daughter from before that I have from another marriage, and we have one daughter uh -huh. together. So it's. it's but yeah. you you were apart from her for a while too, though, weren't you? Because we're no, no, we've been together all the time. She always traveled with me and our dog with, and then with the kid. But now the kid's in school. You weren't dating the the Swedish supermodel in New York for a little while. Well, that was that before? Yeah, that was before. Yeah, that was, that the, was the, the, the girl that went end up uh, with Mark Messier for a little while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can, yeah. I can there was a lot of girls there for a while. But she was the one, always. Yeah, I always loved Japan. I always loved the culture. I always had an interest and, you know, worked over there a bit. And one of my last... When I said, I have to say goodbye to Japan now because something, you know, this is my last trip to Japan, my last production, my last thing I'm going to do in Japan. But I felt something was going to happen. I'm going to say goodbye, but a new thing would take place. Mm -hmm. And I met her. See, the amazing thing is, uh, at that time, the manager, our mutual manager at the time, David said, Littlefield. David Littlefield said Peter Stormare, he's going to be really big. He just did a Coen Brothers movie, and he's, he's, a lot of directors want to hire him, and uh, he'll be just a great guy for you to meet. And I met you, and you had yellow hair still. And he said, oh, don't worry about my hair. <laughs> he's growing out, but he says, it's yellow from the... My hair is not this color. Yeah, yeah. Because you're playing... Bleached. Uh, Fargo, yeah, yeah. Guy, <coughs> guy of Grimthrude. Amazing, and uh, I, I knew you were going to be in... Fargo and, and you're gonna have a great part, but my God, what an impact when yeah, I saw it. I yeah, mean, yeah. Geez. Did you imagine it to be that big? I mean, Oscar, no. you come over mm. here and Oscar. No, the fu funny story is, is that the New York Film Festival, after Barton Fink in Cannes, and the, Joel Cohen called us up and said, uh, well, all the actors up and everybody included in the movie and said, we, we, we've been invited to the New York Film Festival but we're not really ready. And the New York Film Festival, they said, please hurry up, hurry up, and say, we, we're not gonna open until end of February. Mm -hmm. February, we, we don't have the movie ready. It's not, it's not color corrected, we're not the music is there, blah, blah. And they said, please, 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 hurry, hurry. So they said, they hurried up, they did all the editing, color correction, music, everything. They worked really, really hard, sent it to the New, New York Film Festival, mm -hmm. which is in December, mid-December, I think, right. early December. They called us all up and said the movie was returned with a letter saying more or less that this is not, we can't really show this movie in our festival because this movie is not up to par where the New York Film Festival standard yeah. is. So they got it back and they were so depressed that we, I think we've done the biggest flop in movie history. Mm. Don't kill us when, when it's coming out in February. So it was no, I mean, PR, there was nothing for Fargo, you know, nothing. And it took off like a rocket. Right. 
and it's crazy it's the only movie from the 90s that is on the first hundred years of Hollywood filmmaking the best movies there's only one movie from the 90s and that's Fargo wow that's incredible only one movie from the entire 90s that ended up on the 100 years of movie it, making. And it didn't win the Oscar because it was a pretty tough year with the English Patient had all that. Yeah, you know, yeah. What a boring movie that was. It had a lot of momentum. And yeah. um, I mean, yeah. even the actors, William H. Macy, I mean, I thought she should have won, but uh, yeah. you know, Jerry Maguire. Yeah. I thought you and Steve should be nominated, but... Uh, Francis got it, though. Francis yeah. McDormand got the the, the, uh, the lead. But only Godfather gets three supporting actor nominations, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, it was tough. But Looking back, people would nominate all three of you, you know what I mean? Yeah, the English patient. Oh, boy. Anything from England, you know. Yeah. Anything right. from England. Yeah. What happened to those? James and Ivory or what? what no, it was um, Anthony no. Minghella. Yeah, it was. He passed yeah. away a couple years ago. Yeah, he did. Uh, I shouldn't trash things, but sometimes in this country, coming from another, from coming from Europe, in this country, they bow down to the English culture like, mm. like they're praying to Allah. Right. You know, if somebody comes from England, comes from England like a director or whatever, and has the British accent, everybody here like, wow, wow. Yeah, but, but now they take all the American parts on TV. Yeah, yeah. Because, and the Aussies too. Yeah, yeah. It's, this is a very strange country. You don't still have that apartment, do you? No, no, on Willow, nice place. Willow Place in Brooklyn Heights, Dang. number 14. Yeah. Nah, yeah, it was very Your place nice. bigger now, though, probably. Yeah, yeah, but we had a beautiful big patio. Oh. You remember the big patio yeah, yeah, in the yeah. whole backyard? Yeah, it was beautiful. When I met you then, though, did you feel like, oh, I got this big movie coming out, this should really do a lot for me? Or did you, did you really, because of, you know, all the negative setbacks? No, but being born back in Sweden in, in a small village up north, mainly snow i knew being very young i'm five years old my mother is still alive can confirm it i was five years old and i walked around with the bible under you know my arm mm -hmm. i either and i told them i i want to become a pastor but i really can't because i have to move to the U united states of america california mm -hmm. when i'm older and they asked me what am i what am you going to do back in california mm -hmm. I said, I, I don't know, but I think I'm going to work with movies. Yeah. I started when I was five years old. So if it's intuition or a dream, I, I don't know. I always knew that I would live in this country, work with movies. And if I had to work as a carpenter on the side, mm -hmm. I don't mind. i never been seeking my luck for fame and money. I do this because it's my craft. I n have known it inside my heart and soul since I was born. Mm. And maybe that's why I'm working all the time because I'm not asking for astronomically big paychecks. I show up. I n never been to rehab. I never taken drugs. Uh, I have a beer occasionally, but I show up. You don't up. smoke, right? No. Because I was smoking a cigar. Cigar and bagels all night long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had like two, three cigars. Like cigars yeah. like, like two hours long, two cigars. And I just, in a movie, bagels. I had to smoke cigars in the scene. Jesus Christ, I was so sick. Yeah, you do it wrong, though. People would think that you, you, know, yeah, you, so you, you do shots and What do you, smoke you do cigars, when, I don't like when people smoke, you know, if they're smoking. Mm. It looked fake. You had to do it for real. Right. I, I don't think if, if you die from it, it was worth it. For that movie mm -hmm. but I always known in my heart I would come to this country I always want to become an American and I am an American since many years I'm proud of being a American mm -hmm. and and I'm gonna continue working until I just you know fall off the chair you see the impression I, I got because of what I was told that you know you, you directed opera in, yeah. in Japan yeah. and you come from the theatrical background I thought you'd be happy just doing experimental theater and then the movie thing just suddenly happened with the explosion of Fargo. And, but uh, you've always loved the movies. I always loved the movies. I love experimental theater, and but I did a lot of it. I had 10 years when I did a lot of theater and that was in Stockholm mm -hmm. at a repertoire theater. I've directed so many shows. I've been in so many performances. I was on stage for 10 years every darn uh, night, mm -hmm. except Mondays. 
and even in New York you do eight performances in a week mm -hmm. and it's like every night at eight o'clock you're there you're there you're there 600 people 800 people 400 people 200 people but every night and it's very demand it's like being a foot soldier it's like being a you're just doing the unknown journey for a couple of weeks then it's the opening night, then you become a foot soldier or an assembly worker. It's, it's a hard profession to do. You have to love the audience and you have to love yourself and to expose yourself. I, I was very negative. Every darn night I said you could have done better, you could have done better, you could have done better. And I didn't like the negative surrounding I had back in Sweden at the mm -hmm. theater. It's a lot of negativity and I'm not a negative person and I my life is a journey an unknown journey but I knew I, I was coming here to do film movies TV whatever and uh, hopefully I'll continue till mm -hmm. till the day I die yeah see I didn't know that you know that was always the thing that you ultimately wanted to achieve because I thought yeah. you, you wanted to kind of do both see how it is in America and I thought maybe the explosion of fire really brought you so many opportunities that you just yeah but, but this is something this is couldn't have been better right you no no I'm, I'm a very happy human being if I die tomorrow you can always say on your program that Peter died as a very happy human being when I met you you probably had maybe what maybe under 10 TV film credits you yeah, know, yeah, in yeah. Sweden and maybe Damage and Fargo yeah, in America. Yeah, now yeah. you've got 120, 120 yeah. 130 things on your... Yeah, I'm, I'm a, like John Lennon said, I'm a grasshopper. I love to do anything from animation, you know, like voiceover. Right. I love doing voiceover. And I love doing independent movies. Mm -hmm. I love to do crazy scripts. Maybe that's the experimental Cause, side yeah, of me. You, yeah, you get off on that even doing commercials. Yeah. Like, like yeah. all that Volkswagen stuff. Yeah. Because we even won the shorts, prize in Cannes, best commercial of the year. Right. Even those little shorts about the Swedish culture. That, yeah. That's the, all that stuff is funny too. Yeah, it, it is. And it's like me being a musician I'm bad at so many instruments but I play all the instruments I can mm -hmm. and I create music it sounds strange and crazy but but it is me it's my music mm -hmm. I love to write I love write poetry I it's I constantly going I have a hard time to sit and watch TV I never watch TV I mm -hmm. never see movies it's amazing. That, that's a strange thing but I know hockey players I know basketball players professionals yeah. they don't sit and watch basketball and hockey when they're off they do other things unless so. they're getting paid to uh, commentate or something like yeah like yeah later on but during their career you yeah. don't run home to watch hockey on tv when you play hockey all the time yeah actually i don't know in Mer i think some of them do actually but i i never see movies i never see my own movies that's amazing that's amazing i have, to me. I have no interest to sit for two hours in a in a you know in a cinema oh. I never see TV. When you read the Fargo script, did you think, "Wow, this is amazing"? The part. Well, did you? Because that's, you didn't say much. No, like, I did, did you want? Did you? Th what did you bring to it going in? I mean, they they know what they're who they're casting. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So. No, the only thing I talked about was, I've got the dialect up there. I can talk the you know the Minnesotan. I've been up there. Mm -hmm. I know how they talk. <laughs> you know. And I said, I have some few lines. Is that because you don't think I can do Minnesotan? No, that's the way this guy was. He's built on a true character. Mm. And he said, he would never said anything. He was chain smoker. He fell asleep smoking in bars. So they said, this is a guy from our childhood that we grew up with. And this is the way it's supposed to be. That's the way he was. So. Were you familiar with Steve Buscemi's work? Yeah. Yeah, and I had met Steve briefly, yeah. And also, you know, Miller's Crossing. Yeah. <laughs> Seen Miller's Crossing because that's the first time I got an offer because I'd been in New York and I'd done Hamlet in New York mm -hmm. and they had seen Hamlet with a Bergman production coming to BAM for three weeks and it was a sold out, a big, big success and they offered me a part in Miller's Crossing. Wow. And coming back to, to Sweden to the National Theater and saying to the boss, "Hey, I got, I got to go three months from now. I have an offer from the Cohn Brothers." And no, no, you're gonna be here doing this and this. And then I had to turn down Wim Wenders in a movie. Then I just said, "Oh, it's time to me to leave." 
I see. Now it's time to leave. I turned down two see, big offers. And when I was on the peak, maybe artistically, I can't call it the peak, but I, I had, I could do anything that I wanted. Maybe at the mm -hmm. theater, I was a director. I did lead parts. I can pick and choose. I could direct TV, I'd be in TV and movies. But it's very nice when you're up there on the very, very peak. I just left the theater. I just wrote a letter. I resigned. I had a golden contract for life. I said, I resign. I ripped the contract. I will no longer come to the theater. Mm -hmm. I would do my duty for the next two months to do these performances, but then you have to replace me because I'm out. Wow. And I told the boss, <laughs> and I told Bergman, who got very angry at me, and, uh, but I said to him, hey, you told me to follow my dreams, you know, to follow the boys within. That's what I'm doing. Oh, so he had to confront Bergman himself? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my God. So. But you know, he, he, and we had a love for each other, so he understood. He said, oh, are you going to be like Max? You're just going to go after money? I don't know anything about Max von Sydow, I said. Mm. I am just, I just want to be a human being. Yeah. I follow, I'm a believer, I said, I follow God's voice. God has told me it's time to leave. i got to go over the Atlantic Ocean. And he said, if, if you can hear that voice within you that's strong, mm. then, you know, make sure you have a return ticket. And I said, no, in my life, we never have a return ticket. Wow. I, I, I can't go out on the ice and see if it will break or not and then run back. I, I always want to go out because when you're in jeopardy, when you really go out on thin ice, that's even when you perform or act, that's when your autopilot kicks in. Mm -hmm. But people are sort of swap themselves in cotton, you know, and safety nets. But you have to face, you have to push yourself in, into corner or onto a brink, onto a cliff hanging from that little branch over a big canyon. Because then there's something within you, it's chemicals, it's ideas that starts popping up. But people are just holding on to the, you know, to the trunk all the time. Mm. I like to push myself out there because at least in my body, when I don't have the money, when I don't have the job, in my career, when it was really, really hard, I just let myself over to the big, big voice to guide me right. And I think a lot of people that lead their lives sort of in a very, very, you know, every month is this, the paycheck, do this, you do mm -hmm. this, you do this, and blah, blah, blah. It's a very, very sort of boxed in lifestyle. But sometimes you have to push yourself. And sometimes it happens to people who has, they come down with a sickness, like a cancer, or they have a tragedy traffic accident mm -hmm. they say it's like you got to be guarded by angels that you could survive this traffic accident or this accident of blah 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 you survived cancer but some people when they face tragedy there's something inside your body that is so beautiful mm -hmm. and and I'm telling you every cell in your body when you're out there in the desert and you dying of thirst, there's still the last little cell that's still alive in you will fight for you no matter what. Mm -hmm. Your body is so faithful to you, the body is so loyal and they want you to be alive. It's Death is a natural thing to me. I, I've never been afraid of dying. Mm -hmm. I know I'm going to die. But until I die, the body will fight every day. Even if you put cocaine or you're shooting up heroin, you're drinking, you do crazy stuff to kill yourself. No, there is cells in your body that will fight for you to survive this mayhem of shit we put in our bodies. And that's been my, my life. And I, I'm not afraid of moving into little, little, studio apartment mm. that's why I love my wife because 
she's the same way. We're two loners in a way. We live in our world and we like each other. And we don't want a big house in Bel Air. I don't need six cars. Mm -hmm. It's enough. I, I ride around on a bicycle most of the time. I'm endorsed by Adidas, which I'm proud of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I wear Adidas a lot. I'm sorry for this. Right. But I don't need much. I have no jewelry, no expensive things. I don't buy a lot of stuff. No blinks. No, and it's, this is a gift from the voice of the universe that I'm following. I have a path in my life that I have to walk. I have to walk this path. And why I have to walk this path is it's a pact between me and the universe. Mm -hmm. So it's I'm I'm not afraid if if some if God that I call God would come down today or tomorrow when I turn the corner and mm -hmm. say, Peter, from today on there will be no movies, no theater, no TV, no acting, no directing, nothing at all. I would clap my hands and say, what are we going to do? Mm. What's next then? Right. And I have an appetite of life. I'm curious as hell. And I wish I could be 200 years old so I could see everything in this world because this world is still big. Mm. It's a very, very big world mm. and I travel a lot. But there's places I still want to see. And I, I had a very good friend, an old actress that sort of became my surrogate mother out here, Signa Hasso. She, she became like over 90 years old. But one of her last words to me when she died was, there's still so many places I want to see. There's wow. still so many people I would like to meet. Wow. So that's, that's life for you in a way. I came, I've come to the point in my life where I know I'm not going to be able to see all the movies you're supposed to see. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to read all the books you're supposed to read. And it's great for me because I, all of a sudden I have nothing at home. You should see my home. It's like a sacristy. It's like a... It's like a temple, white walls, no photos, like wood floor, benches, tatamis and stuff, very it Japanese. It was like that when I went to your place. Yeah, it was very, very, uh, yeah very Japanese, like clean. just sparse. Yeah. Like a dojo. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's uh, I don't like things laying around, you know, it's, I want soul, my soul to have peace when I come to my home. Mm -hmm. And... Um, but were you ever able to reconcile with uh, Bergman or people you left in Sweden? Yeah. About yeah. Yeah. Because, of you, because you, even if you went back a year or two years later, you had a lot of success already. Yeah. Yeah. You, it was a jump off the cliff. Yeah. It, you, it was coming over, but yeah, and but you did very well immediately. We, we, yeah, we we were always very very good friends. He took me under his wings, being young and he sort of confirmed me in things that I wanted to do. He sort of confirmed me. It's great to have like be a young painter and have Picasso next to you saying, mm -hmm. you're on the right track, brother. Right. Just continue. Because he, he wasn't doing any movie, movies anymore, right? He was no, just in theater. No, I was in a small, small little part like a walk-on in Fan Alexander. But, but Ingmar was like Picasso, just saying, continue painting. I said, how should I do this here, you know? He said, no, 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 you can't ask me. You have to find out yourself. No, he was, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I miss him a lot, but we always talk. Mm -hmm. We're always on the phone with each other. It was like a weekly thing and until we got sick. But I missed him, he missed me. But he, he coined a thing that I use. He said, with you and me, he said, some people you have this connection even if we're far apart no time no space can keep us apart mm -hmm. and now he's in another dimension mm -hmm. he's gone and if i have if i have problem with a part or whatever i go to my little little corner i go to my trailer and I just said, to say, I talked to Ingmar. How the hell am I going to solve a scene, Ingmar? T 
tell me how the hell I'm because I, I'm working with a director that doesn't have a clue how should you have done it mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it comes so artistically his he's his biggest influence for you he told yeah you. yeah because because also my parents lived abroad and I, I pretty young and getting into a very rough environment you know like the national theater in any of the European countries it's like a snake pit mm -hmm. everybody's I mean especially when you come in young and you get big parts and I became sort of Bergman's protege mm -hmm. the chosen people, one yeah people have lo knives you know right every time and I to turn walk away from, and to walk away from that yeah. that gives them a more excuse to uh, they were they you. were flabbergasted when I walked away I just I, I was over in Europe to do I met an old friend of mine he was in the same movie and he said you just left man nobody knew really where you went mm. you just left and then all of a sudden said, no he's in the movie you, you there, there and there you know mm. he's in the US and I think for me being in my village one day it was I had to move one day the voice just said you got to go down to Stockholm. Mm -hmm. What am I supp supposed to do in Stockholm? You're going to find out. I didn't know. It's, it's like I got a ticket for a, for a re dress rehearsal mm -hmm. of, of a play. And I went to the National Theatre and I still know the seat I sat in. And I saw the play which, by the way, is one of the worst bombs in the history of the National Theater. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but for me, I just cried. I sat, I never went out during the intermission. I just sat and I cried all the time because it's like the doors to heaven had opened to me. And uh, I just said, oh, I'm, I'm home. This is my home. This is the place where I want to be. And it's crazy to think five six years after i saw my first play i'm on the stage doing lead parts mm -hmm. it's pretty crazy it's the right. same it's the same thing I, i'm going up to northern japan marioka mm -hmm. is called northern japan they had revived one of my my productions i think it was my japanese hamlet it was selected to one of the best plays that they would take it on a tour in Japan and the first was Marioka up in the north. And I sitting in the Shinkansen, the train going up there. I look out, it's a beautiful, beautiful day. All the fields outside is very rural before you come to the city. And I see myself standing as a young kid when I'm sitting at, you know, waving to me. I knew it was my I could see myself being seven, eight years old, standing there, waving. And I thought, Jesus, when I look back at my life from a tiny village up in, north of, in northern Sweden, and here I am, seated at the Shinkansen in Japan, going up to a city where they're going to honor me with, you know, some medal or, and have this opening of my hamlet the touring version of Hamlet and I thought how the heck is this possible you're a lucky son of a gun but then a few years later you're on a big set with Bruce Willis and Michael Bay yeah. production yeah yeah and, and it's it's I think Oscar nominated <laughs> film and box office champ film I mean the Armageddon yeah. was huge yeah that was for your first couple of films <laughs> yeah Armageddon Everywhere I go, people just quote me still. That's, that's great. I can always go through the, the screening at the LAX or any airport in the world and say, oh, the Russian cosmonaut. Right, right. <laughs> but it's, it's just part of the journey. I could have taken another route. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the manager we had in common, mm -hmm. David Littlefield. After Fargo, I was offered so much money, I was offered so many parts, I was offered so many bad scripts and so many bad directors. Usually what happens when you come 
from abroad. Mm -hmm. It happens to Americans too. They do a character that really knocks the audience out. Right, right. Then there was a horde of scripts, but it's like B scripts with sort of B directors, mm -hmm. and they wanted me to have my bleached hair. Mm -hmm. They wanted me to have the Clint Eastwood coat. Mm -hmm. They had, you know, it was sort of doing the same part. Mm -hmm. And I, I talked to Davian, our manager, and she said there's two ways, two roads to walk in, in Hollywood, longevity or money. And I said, how do you mean? Either you work in this business until you die, as long as you want, or you grab the money and run. Let's, if you want, we can do this money. You're going to get offered a million for this maybe and maybe a, start with a half a million up to a million and maybe you do five, six movies, the same character. Mm -hmm. If you're lucky, you can make with a, you know, points at the end or whatever, you can make 10, 50 million dollars if they turn up. This out. is within a year or so? No, like five, five, five years, yeah. five years, you know. But she said after five years, yeah. you're out. Yeah. You can't do anything else. Right. But if that's the route you want to take, I would help you and guide you, but I don't think you want that. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I, I want longevity. I want to work until I die. Then we we'll have to turn this everybody down. Mm -hmm. Don't ever think about the money. Let's do just projects that mm -hmm. we love and you love and I love. Right. And if they pay you decent enough money so you have to for rent and for food, mm -hmm. that's enough, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't need to buy anything. I don't. I don't have anything. Right. You should. I. I have a storage that's half this little room. It's like what is it? Four by six. <laughs> that's my storage room, mm -hmm. and my house is just sparse and empty. I. I don't have anything. I have a car, but I usually get ten thousand miles in L.A. Mm -hmm. three years. I usually on a bicycle. And I'm not a big spender. I don't spend money. I help family members out with money if I have something over. I have family in Nigeria that I've taken through college, five kids, and I help the parents for 25 years with money. And I donate to hospitals and stuff. But, but personally, if I don't, if I couldn't work in this business, mm -hmm. I would pick up a, I would work in construction. I do interior design. I could, I'm skillful. I'm skillful. I, I'm a survivor. I'm not afraid of life. Like most people are, if I'm going to lose my job, if I'm going to lose my job, what the hell am I going to do? Maybe sometimes the best thing is in life is when you work 15 years for the same company maybe or whatever that the whole company goes belly up mm -hmm. because you can't just I, I feel sorry for human beings that do the same thing throughout their whole life and most of them are miserable mm -hmm. because I think happiness is nothing you can grab it's like the end of the ra rainbow but you can strive for happiness by by doing things and maybe it's if your dream is just to open up a florist shop at least try it if your dream is to become a poet at least try it don't sit and whine about it mm -hmm. at least write then and go and try to publish it publish it yourself and now with the internet do it over the internet whatever it's the outlets are so much bigger now than it's mm -hmm. ever been before that's what you're doing with your music right yeah mm -hmm. and it's it's passion. It's passion and it's also good for the brain. Mm -hmm. Why in this country too, everybody goes to a darn shrink to fix the problems when you can fix them yourself from within. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need guidance, you need a helping hand, but maybe you can get that helping hand from, a, from just a friend. Mm -hmm. Instead of paying $500 a session for a shrink. Because I think we have stopped realizing how how much force and how much energy and how much things we can tap into as human beings you have everything within your own body 
but we forget about it. Mm -hmm. We really do. We forget about it. And some of us, when you get poor, you realize that you really don't need much. No, the, you don't when, need when much. When things are good, you, it's just excess, and you don't need all that stuff. And you feel like you need more and more, and you know that becomes a whole obsession it is, in itself. It is a sickness in the capitalist world. It's like we, we're forced to buy, 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 buy. Mm. And you have to be strong. It's and that's like what they keep feeding on TV too. So yeah. you may not even know it when you're watching commercials, but that's what they're. Yeah, that's why I never watch TV, <laughs> yeah. unless the Kings play. No, you like the Kings. Yeah. <laughs> but it what is. What about the Rangers? Uh, 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 uh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Rangers, okay. You liked them back then, didn't you? Okay, yeah, I love them now too, and I know I know the goalie. So yeah. so it's he's a Swede, yeah. so. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. He plays with McEnroe. Yeah. In the band. Yeah, yeah. I used to play with McEnroe too. Yeah. I got McEnroe's last racket, uh, the racket. He. Yeah, you told me you, yeah. you were going to use it. And I said, no, no, don't use it. That's McEnroe. <laughs> McEnroe, he came. Yeah, he came into the bar straight from the, from the airplane up in New York, to the bar where we used to play, and. He, he was really good impersonator of Bjorn Borg. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was so funny. Yeah. But he came with all his gear into the bar, not going home at all. He gave me the racket. This is the last racket, he said. He lost in the semi semifinals. And he said, but this is the last one. It's for you. And he was Dumbo, supposed right? to sign it, yeah. but we <laughs> forgot to sign it. I still have it at home, right. but he, you know in a closet somewhere. Mm -hmm. I don't have it on the wall right. saying McEnroe's last racket. Maybe you should. Yeah, but no, it's not me. I have nothing on the walls. Right. I don't keep anything. 